Good, okay, so I said that alpha beta speeds up the search. This alpha beta pruning, it's guaranteed to give exactly the same result and find the optimal move, but it does it faster because it prunes off some of the branches, right? So it's often helpful to do minimax search first and then do alpha beta pruning and just make sure that you get back the same answer. Now for a small tree like this, you don't really see the speed up particularly, but for a larger tree, the speed up becomes enormous. So we said that minimax search, the complexity is order b to the power m. If the moves are ordered in a good way, then the time complexity reduces to b to the power m over 2. So it's actually the square root of what it would have been otherwise. So if b is 10 and m is 12, <laughs> let's say, then minimax search would take 10 to the 12th, which is a trillion evaluations, but alpha beta search may only take b to the 6, which is a million. So if you reduce it from, it's the same as the reduction from breadth first to bidirectional search. If you can reduce something from a trillion to a million, that's an enormous speed up. Another way to look at it is that you can search twice as deep with the same amount of computation time. So if Minimax can only search six moves ahead, by changing to alpha beta, I can now search 12 moves ahead. That makes a huge difference. So with chess, if you're looking six moves ahead and then you switch to 12 moves ahead, you become a much stronger player. And the reason for this is basically it's, it's not searching half the nodes at each level, it's kind of alternating. At every second level, it's searching all children and then at every other level, it's just searching one child and pruning everything else. So it's interesting to see how this is achieved. So chess, yeah, so Deep Blue, it's, God, it's, what is it, 20 years ago now, yeah. So in 1997, Deep Blue defeated the human chess champion, that was Gary Kasparov. Now, what you learn from, well, okay, the tic-tac-toe, I mean, I'll leave it to you to sort of work through the details before, I, before we do it in the tutorials. But the trick is that you try to give your opponent as many options as possible. The more options they have, the harder it is for them to search, right? So if you look at the, you know, there was a series of these matches between humans and computers going back to the 70s against uh, Korshnoi and then Karpov. And until 97, the humans were always able to beat the computers. The way they did it is, yeah, the computers were using this brute force search. So the human would try to open up the board and, and create a position where many, many different moves are possible. That was the strategy. Because if there's lots and lots of options, it's going to take longer for the computer to search and they won't be able to search as deep. Exactly kind of analogous to what goes on with tic-tac-toe but on a bigger scale. And that strategy worked all the way up <laughs> until this, and if you look at these games, which it's only six games, but if you look at these games between Kasparov and Deep Blue, Kasparov is trying to do that. He's opening up the board and, and trying to you know, give more options, and then he <laughs> but then somehow like the computer still manages to play good moves because it's just so fast. You know, they had, this was a huge project, they had dedicated hardware that was built specifically to evaluate chess positions and this kind of stuff. And he just gets flustered and he can't believe that the computer's doing so well and sort of loses his nerve and stuff. So it's exploiting the weakness of the opponent in the sense that of limiting their search, if that's, you know, if they're doing search. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but other games, if you, if you know that you're, if you can figure out, this was the thing we were talking about with rock, paper, scissors and so on, if you, if you can, predict that your opponent is likely to make certain types of mistake, then you can exploit that. Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking that for pure alpha beta pruning, if, if you could actually kind of search the entire tree, then yeah. you might successfully. Yeah, but you're never, I don't think you realize, you're, no one's ever going to search the whole tree for chess, no. you know, because it would take <laughs> trillions of years you know, if you devoted the entire computing resources of the planet <laughs> to it, it would take trillions of years. I mean, it's just totally infeasible. Although it's interesting also that 
before this before this deep blue thing, people were exploring end game situations where the branching factor is quite small, and they you know one person has a rook and a bishop, and the other person has a rook and a knight or something, and who's going to win? You may have to look a hundred moves ahead to determine that. There were these computers that had been specifically trained for those situations, and the grandmasters who played against them said they felt like they were playing chess against God. <laughs> because the computer could just look so far ahead. Yeah, yeah. Checkers, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about checkers, but checkers is something Schaefer claims that he has a perfect, he's got a player that he says he can prove will never lose. Yeah, so checkers is sort of manageable that way, I suppose. So, yeah, the algorithms have got better. So, in what way they got better? Well, part of it is just hardware getting faster. Um, but also there's certain enhancements to alpha beta search, certain tricks that you can do to speed it up. And then the other thing is machine learning. So these, these values, you know, how much is it really worth to have the knight on this square instead of that square? You know, if you can use machine learning to tune that, then you're going to get a better player. Yeah. Okay, we talked about chess. Now checkers. <coughs> right, so... Samuel's player was good, but not quite as good as the best humans. So this team in Canada led by Jonathan Schaefer started working on checkers again in the 1990s. And they developed this Chinook checkers player and they put it up against Marion Tinsley. Now Marion Tinsley is a legend in the checkers community. This guy was the human checkers champion for 40 years, from his mid-20s until his mid-60s. And he played in a match against Chinook in 1994. And the problem is that Tinsley was kind of sick at the time. He was dying of cancer and had to pull out and didn't finish the match. So it was really sort of inconclusive. But the computers have beaten every subsequent human. And Schaefer, <laughs> he started getting nasty emails <laughs> after that. Oh, you took advantage of a sick man and... <laughs> Tinsley in his prime could have definitely beaten Chinook and so on. So a self-confessed, obsessive, compulsive, eventually he set out to try to prove that his player would never lose. You know, and Tinsley, actually Tinsley, in his entire career, Tinsley only lost five games. <laughs> Sometimes he drew the five games that he lost. Two of them were in, ch in uh, competition and the other three were in situations where he'd go to a shopping centre and he's playing simultaneously against 20 other people. <laughs> Each person has a long time to think about their move and then he's just walking from board to board, <laughs> making moves, you know, thinking a couple of seconds. And, you know, on an off day, you know, people, on three occasions, people managed to win against him on three of those occasions. So he, Marion Tinsley was not quite perfect, but almost perfect. Schaefer set out to prove that his player would actually be perfect. And the way he did, so he did actually do a full exploration almost of the game. It's not, when I say full exploration, it's not exploring every move by both players. It's exploring every move by the opponent and then saying which move you would do in that situation. So it's full exploration at every second level, basically. There's the same kind of techniques that are applied to chess, but... Uh, he had these end game databases. So initially he had a database of every position that had six or fewer pieces on the board. Sorry, I don't have a picture of checkers here, but it's a sort of a simple, ver you know, you don't have different types of piece, you've just got one type of piece, but then when it gets to the end of the board it can become a king and then it can move backwards. The pieces only move on the red squares, not on the white squares. So you know, this is why it's a simpler game than, than chess. So he built up this database of all positions with six or fewer pieces on the board. And for every one of those positions, he figured out whether that position was a win for black or a win for white or a draw. You think about how unnerving this is for, for the human. As soon as you get to a position with six or fewer pieces, the Chinook doesn't have to do any search at all. It just looks up in a database, oh yeah, that position is a win for black. And then he expanded it to all positions with eight or fewer pieces. 
and he was thinking about this in the year 2000 and he was thinking, you know, for the one with six or fewer pieces, he used a 32-bit machine. He realised for the larger database with eight or fewer pieces, he'd need 64-bit machine. So he thought, well, I could go to the trouble of trying to simulate 64-bit on a 32-bit machine or I could just sit and wait for three years, four years, and eventually the 64-bit machines will come out and then they can use a real 64-bit machine, which is what he did. When he got the 64-bit machine, the first thing he did was rerun the code uh, to generate the database for the six pieces and he found that there were discrepancies. There were three positions that were classified differently from his original database and he was trying to look through to see if there was a bug in the code and it turned out, well, he's keeping these databases very compressed. You know, he's breaking them up into pieces and highly compressing each piece. So every move gets compressed, you know, 20 moves get compressed into one bit or something like this. And if you, when you buy a hard drive, it actually says in the fine print that, uh, you know, occasionally a bit might flip randomly in the hard drive. <laughs> and this is what had actually happened. That's why it was, it was misclassifying those. Because, you know, if it's an image and a bit flips, you know, no one would even notice. But in this case, you know, he did notice. So then he started to set up these processes that would cross-check his database at the end of every week with what he had before and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, it's like I told you, he's obsessive. Uh, Go. Now, Go is a very interesting game. It's got a very high branching factor. So the traditional, uh, you know, chests, like I said, are like a simple evaluation function in chests, like just counting the material on the board gives you, plays a pretty good game. Um, with Go, it's very hard to come up with a uh, simple evaluation like that. And the branching factor is very big. So you alternate putting white and black stones on the board. And if you surround your opponent's stones, you can capture them and take them off the board. So there's 361 squares on the board. And at each move, you can play it almost into any blank square. So the branching factor could be like 200. And so you can't do the sort of traditional approach to chess. Now, in the 90s, people tried to write programs that would you know, divide the board into regions and do some logical reasoning about a region and this and that. Then in 2006, there was this new approach called Monte Carlo Tree Search. So this is a bit similar to Alpha Beta Search, but it doesn't search every possible move. It just sort of devotes more search to the more promising moves. And once it gets to a certain point, instead of statically evaluating that board, it tries to randomly play. The original ones just randomly played out the rest of the game to see who would win. You know, so originally it was just totally random moves and then they put in some very simple heuristics and pattern matching to try to play it out in a slightly more intelligent way. These players actually became superior to the previous ones. And then more recently, people have been applying deep learning and neural networks. So a few of us tried playing around with neural networks for Go about 10 years ago, but the computers, the GPUs were quite sort of slow in those days. But as probably most of you know, last year, a team from Google DeepMind in London had a big project and they managed to actually beat the, um, the human Go champion. So they did it with deep learning neural networks combined with this Monte Carlo tree search and the networks, they had two networks, one for evaluation, one for move selection. These networks were initially trained by looking at a huge database of, of games between human grandmasters and then afterwards they were refined by having the networks play against themselves for millions of games. All the games we looked at so far are deterministic. Then we get into games which involve Dice rolls, uh, such as this game here, backgammon. We'll look in more detail at backgammon later in the course, but basically you, you roll the dice and then you move pieces according to what you rolled on the dice. So if you roll a six and a five, that means you can move one piece five points and another piece six points. You know, you have to decide which pieces to move and whoever gets the pieces off the board first wins. It's a bit more complicated than that. In certain situations, you can land on your opponent and send them back to the beginning. But this general principle of a stochastic games where you have some sort of random element, how do we deal with that? Well, again, let's just look at a very simple example. 
So this is similar to the games we were looking at before. Someone's paying money to someone else. So this is how this game works. First, you make a choice. So you can choose either the left branch or the right branch. And then we toss a coin. If the coin is heads, we go left. If the coin is right, if the coin is tails, we go right. So neither of us has control over the coin toss. We just have to live with whatever it comes up with. And then I make a choice about how much I'm going to pay you. So let's think about this game for a minute. So if, we, if the game reaches this point, I want to pay you as little as possible, so I'll choose the two over the four. I'll choose the four over the seven. Now what about here? Well, neither of us control the coin toss, so the only sensible thing we can do is average the values. You've got a 50% chance of getting $2 and a 50% chance of getting $4. That means on average your expected amount of money is $3. The, on the right-hand side, you've got zero and minus two. So the minus two obviously means you're going to pay me the money. And this is a 50-50 chance, so this is minus one. And then the max guy will choose the three over the minus one. So what's happened here is with minimax we had min nodes and we had max nodes. Here we introduce a new type of node which is called a chance node. So the min nodes we take the minimum, the max nodes we take the maximum, and the chance nodes we average out the values. So it's basically just an extension to minimax and we call this expectimax. Right. Now, if in a game like backgammon, I think there's uh, 18 different ways the dice can roll. So you, you, know, you would, the previous player would make a move, and then you'd have 18 different branches here. You know, whether it's one and two, one and three, one and four, etc. So the rolling of the dice is considered as a separate event, and then after the dice have been rolled that constrains what moves I'm able to choose from. Now, there's two things to note about this. So one is, you know, is there a version of alpha-beta pruning? You know, is there an equivalent of alpha-beta pruning for this? The answer is you can't do as much pruning, but there is a way to get some pruning. So one of the activities, you'll be exploring that in a simple situation. The other point, and this is a bit of a subtle point, with minimax, all that matters is the ordering of the positions, whether one position is preferred over another. So if I had three final positions which I evaluated as 1, 2, and 4, but then I changed my evaluation so that it's 1, 20, and 400, minimax will actually come back with the same answer. Because as long as any two positions, you know, which one you prefer over the other, as long as that's preserved, that's all that Minimax cares about, is really the ordering, not the actual numerical values. But when we do Expectimax, it does matter. We need an actual value because we want to average the actual values. So this is kind of an abstract example, but how this works in practice is the following. So if we go back to chess, for example, yeah, we just add up all of these numbers, a certain amount for each piece, a certain amount for where the pieces are. We just add them all up and that gives us some number. It could be a positive or a negative number. It might range between minus 100 and plus 100. But for expecting max, what we really want is usually we want to know a number between 0 and 1 that tells us the probability of winning from that particular state. That's what we want in, this, in backgammon, for example. So what we do is we take that linear sum and then we compose it with another function it's called a sigmoid function, and it keeps the things in the same order, but it, re it squashes the evaluation into a number between 0 and 1. This is also important when we do machine learning. So we'll, we'll come back to this again when we talk about neural networks and so on, but this is just something to keep in mind. Now then we get to partially observable games. So if you remember, in the second week I was talking about the difference between card games and uh, dice games. So dice games, once the dice have been rolled, everyone can see what they are. But card games, I have cards that you can't see and vice versa. So we actually need a different kind of strategy for card games. Bridge is a game that's similar to poker. People hold cards in their hand and bid and then play them out. Now, there was a program called Jib, which for many years was the best bridge-paying program, and the way it worked was as follows. 
Here it has information about what bids people have made and what cards people have already played. And on that basis it tries to guess what cards the other person has in their hand or the other people have in their hands. And it kind of randomly generates a possible set of cards that the other people could have. And it says, well, if that were the case, what move would I make? And then it does it again. Let's generate another set of cards which is consistent with the information that I've already seen. So it generates a hundred such possibilities. For each possibility it decides what would be its best move to make and then it kind of votes, you know, among those hundred, what's the most popular move? Sorry, yeah? Just out of curiosity, for this question, I've never gone in like poker or this. Have they ever tried to use also machine learning to understand uh, the opponent's face and whether the person <laughs> 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 Ah, very good question. So the question was, um, have they tried to use machine learning on the opponent's face to tell whether they're bluffing? <laughs> that would be <laughs> a good idea. But the truth is these, these serious poker players are really good at not showing any expression. You know, they have their poker face. I'm digressing here, but I read a, a description of, um, you know, about roulette, right? You spin the wheel and then the ball. In roulette, you're actually allowed to bid. So there's this long history to this. Someone went to Monte Carlo in like 1650 and stood there by the roulette wheel for two weeks and marked down every outcome and figured out that you know, the roulette wheel was a bit unbalanced and then used this to win a lot of money. And then after that, the, the, they would kind of be dynamically balanced every morning to make sure that they were fair and stuff. But this was in the late 80s. Someone realized like you're allowed to bid while the wheel is actually in motion. And so someone figured out, well, if you know which number is going past when the ball is released, you can actually exploit that information to win money. But then they had to get someone to test it. So they found one of these professional poker players. The problem is, so this guy, they took him into these casinos and he had this uh, laptop computer stuffed up his shirt. He would click a button when the ball got released and then he had some device that in his ear that would, was telling him what to play or something like this. But the problem is if you start, in these casinos, if you start winning money, two really big <laughs> muscly guys come and sit next to you and just like <laughs> sit there and, <laughs> and watch what you're doing. <laughs> but this guy, because he was a poker player, he just, he was absolutely, he looked like he had ice cold blood in his veins. He could sit there with these two guys and just not show any sign of fear or anything like that. Harris, I think his name was Harrison or something like that. I should say, yeah, just recently there's been some very recent work on poker, which is similar to Bridge, and they're actually, there's one team in Alberta that was working on Texas Hold'em and I think another group somewhere, and they're actually modifying Monte Carlo tree search. There's some really technical details. They try to search in a way that's consistent with the information you already have, and then by analysing the opponent's choices, they try to sort of boost up the information on the assumption that the opponent might make a similar choice in a similar situation and so on. So this Monte Carlo tree search and deep learning and stuff is coming into this area as well. So now we move into continuous games, such as Infinite Mario. Now let me see if there's a great video of this. Let me see if I can find it. I mean, this... This goes back to 2009. Um, I think they had a computer competition with Infinite Mario and a couple of other games. And they were hoping that um, to encourage machine learning. But in fact, well, sorry. First of all, they had to reverse engineer the physics. They had to figure out what happens when you do a certain action, which is not easy because it's obviously it's not normal physics. You know, you can jump in a hole and wiggle around and jump out again, which doesn't happen in the real world, right? But they sort of figured that out. What they would do is they would try to plan a few steps into the future. Well, what happens if I do this action? What happens if I do that action and that action? What will be my position 200 milliseconds in the future? And these red lines are actually showing those predictions. So this is basically, it's the same A-star search that we've been looking at 
on the Friday lecture I showed you the robot navigation with A-star search. Well, this is kind of taking it even one, one level further. <laughs> yeah, you see how he went in off. <laughs> Some serious players are being impressed by this, yeah. It's a machine, yeah. So that's Infinite Mario. Now, mo very recently, these Deep Mind guys have been getting into machine learning for some of these games, but Pong is easy. Pac Man they can do, but it's harder. Things like Mario are actually still pretty hard with machine learning. There's still open area of research. Yeah, Pac Man is an interesting game because it combines path planning low-level control, reasoning under uncertainty, because sometimes you actually don't know which way a ghost is going to turn, and so on. So th but th these are the sort of techniques that are used here as well. Rubik Cup Soccer, I showed you all the videos and so on. We use video processing to try to figure out the position of the ball and the position of the goals, and if you can, the position of the other robots, although that sometimes difficult. So the ball, they, in the early days they made the ball this very distinctive orange color so it would be easier to find and the goals were blue and yellow and it, it, initially they even had little be colored beacons around the and then over the years they've just been taking those away bit by bit to try to make the thing harder and I think the ball they're actually using a real what looks like a real soccer ball. So you have the low level vision localization, trying to figure out where you are on the field. You have low-level behaviors like kicking the ball or turning around or saving a goal. And then there's like strategies. So one player may be assigned to try to shoot the goal and then another player may decide to mark another player or a player may wait for an opportunity to get the ball. Uh, this is another kind of continuous task. So this is uh, work that was done by a guy called Greenspan at the Queen's University. He built this pool playing robot. You can watch the little video on the course website. So you've got an overhead camera and you've got another camera that's looking over the top of the queue. I didn't have a picture of this but you know when you take a picture of a big group of people, sometimes the people on the edge look really fat because of the kind of spherical distortion and if you get a perfect uh, checkerboard pattern and put it down on the ground and film it with an overhead camera you can actually see the distortion the, the lines become a bit curved and so on so if you need to know the accurate position of the objects you have to do some mathematical transformation to remove that distortion the ball actually even becomes a little bit egg-shaped because of that distortion. Now in RoboCup we don't worry about that too much, we just pretend it's a sphere. But with this pool playing, you really need much more accurate information because if you hit the ball two millimeters further down or to the side, you're going to get the wrong outcome. So they need to do those sort of things. And if your task is just to sink one ball, I mean, when he worked on this, some people complained and said, oh, this game is too simple, you shouldn't be bothering with this. But it, it's actually, there's some sophistication to it. So if you just ask to sink one ball, you know, you've got the cue ball here and another ball and you want to hit it into the pocket, that's a relatively easy sort of low-level task. You've just got to figure out the angle at which you've got to hit it and so on. But to play pool well, you have to also make the cue ball go to a place where you can hit the next ball in. So sometimes you might want to put backspin on it so that the ball will actually roll back to a, a certain location. Sometimes you want it to hit the other ball and then just stop. Sometimes you want it to come, it to come off at the side. Sometimes you want it to keep going. So there's all of these kind of subtleties. And he actually created a physical simulator so, and ran a competition where people could compete in the simulator to see who would, who would have the best strategy and then the, whoever had the best strategy got to implement their thing on the real robot. And just one final thing, and this is something we'll be picking up on when we get to learning of games. This was work by Donald Mickey in 1961 and Donald Mickey was one of the he worked with Turing at Bletchley Park on the code breaking and also got interested in chess and did some work on chess in the 1960s. 
and he also did some early work in machine learning. He actually had this noughts and crosses player that consisted not of a computer but actually a bunch of matchboxes and beads. The idea was that there was one matchbox corresponding to every possible position and inside the box there was a bead corresponding to every possible move. So you would sort of shake the box and pull out a bead randomly and that's the move you would play and then if you ended up losing the game then you would try to trace back and remove the bead, <laughs> identify the bad move that you made and remove that bead so that you wouldn't make that mistake again. Right? So we'll, we'll talk in more detail about this later but this was very early work in machine learning and games. But you see how, <laughs> how many matchboxes he needed um, just to play tic-tac-toe. So summary, games are fun to work on. They continue to be a driver of new technology. There's a trade-off between speed and accuracy. Some games also require probabilistic reasoning. And the other thing, and you see this particularly in, th in things like RoboCup, it forces you to build a whole system the chain is as strong as its weakest link. So when we went, when you go to these Robocop competitions, you might have the best strategy code in the world, but if there's a bug in your vision code and you can't see the ball because of the lighting conditions, then you know, you're going to catastrophically fail. So it, it's kind of good in a way that it forces people to build whole systems.